In this video, we're going to look at how DNA replicates. DNA replication takes place every single time we have a cell cycle and mitosis occurs. If we look at the cell cycle, there's a G1 phase where the cell is growing and doing normal cell functions, an S phase, which is where DNA replicates, and then G2 and mitosis occur when cell division is going to occur. Not every cell has mitosis, like neurons and skeletal muscle cells, so they don't have a phase where they go through DNA replication. In humans, every cell has 46 chromosomes, so during that S phase, all 46 chromosomes have to replicate. When we look at the DNA structure, we can see that it has a double helix structure. There's a backbone on each side and nucleotides that meet in the middle. If we look a little bit closer at what those nucleotides look like, we see that each nucleotide is composed of a phosphate group, a sugar molecule, and a base, a nitrogenous base. When the base binds to the sugar, it binds to the first carbon. The second carbon tells us if it is a DNA or an RNA sugar. So this is deoxyribose because there's no oxygen. And then on the sugar, the third carbon and the fifth carbon bind to the phosphate. So this gives each nucleotide a direction. So each strand of DNA has a five prime end because the fifth carbon is attached to the phosphate and a three prime end because it is attached to the third carbon. So this forms our sugar phosphate backbone, which is these purple ribbons here. Now the nucleotides, when they combine with the opposite strand, guanine is always going to bind with cytosine and thymine is always going to bind with adenine. Now if this strand of DNA was in the five prime to three prime direction, the other strand is in the opposite direction. This strand will be three prime to five prime. So we call the DNA strands anti-parallel. Now the bonds that hold these things together, the phosphates and the sugars, are combined by phosphodiester bonds, and the nucleotides are held with each opposite nucleotide by hydrogen bonds. There are three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine, and two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine. Now when DNA replicates, the covalent phosphodiester bonds are untouched, they are never broken, and the hydrogen bonds between the bases, they can be broken, and then the two opposite strands can come apart. Before we look at how the process occurs, I wanna just point out a few different things. Adenine and guanine are the double ringed bases, and they are called purines. Cytosine and thymine are the single ringed structures and they are called pyrimidines. A purine always has to combine with a pyrimidine. That's how the DNA molecule stays symmetrical. If you put two purines together, it would cause a bulge in the DNA. Or if you put two pyrimidines together, there would be a little indent in the DNA and then that would be a mutation. When we have a base with a sugar, we call that a nucleoside. And then when we add the phosphate, and then we have the phosphate, the sugar, and the base, that is the nucleotide. Now, when we are replicating DNA, we are actually going to be using nucleoside triphosphates. They are bringing their own energy to the process so that we don't need to use ATP. So when we bring in a nucleoside triphosphate, the last two phosphates are going to be removed, and then the nucleotide will be put into place. Next, I wanna just mention telomeres. And our human eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, whereas bacteria have circular DNA, so it's slightly different. At the ends of our chromosomes, we have these little regions called telomeres. These are repeating sequences of nucleotides. And they are not genes that will code for proteins. These are non-coding regions. So these sequences are important because when we replicate DNA, as you will see in a minute, we have to use primers to start the process. Let's suppose we separate these two strands of DNA 
we are going to have to add a primer sequence at the beginning of each strand so that the polymerase molecule can replicate the DNA. Now, in the middle of this long chromosome, we'll have multiple origins of replication, and the primers all throughout the length of the chromosome will be replaced with DNA, but the very, very first end piece won't. So that means every single time our cells replicate and our DNA replicates, the DNA will get a little bit shorter every single time it replicates. So telomeres shorten, and this is a normal process, and this is why we age. So cells have a lifespan, and organisms have a lifespan. Some cells prevent telomere shortening because they have an enzyme called telomerase, like our germ cells, the stem cells that are going to make eggs and sperm. Those never have shortening telomeres because then every time a new generation was born, they would have a shorter lifespan, but that isn't the case. If we took a magic drug of telomerase so that none of our cells ever aged, what do you think would happen? Think about how throughout our life, our cells are always exposed to all kinds of toxic substances and metabolic byproducts and oxidation and all kinds of chemical reactions. And sometimes mistakes occur. If mistakes accumulate and those cells don't have a lifespan, eventually all of our cells would basically just become cancerous. So it is natural and normal for our telomeres to shorten, for our cells and our bodies to have a lifespan. When we replicate DNA, we know that adenines always combine with thymines and cytosines always combine with guanines. So our DNA replication process is called semi-conservative because we have two strands of DNA that will come apart and then new complementary nucleotides will be added to each of those strands and then we have two new DNA molecules. So you should be able to figure out the complementary strand of any DNA molecule. If I gave you this sequence here, can you figure out what the complementary sequence is? Notice that there's a three prime end and a five prime end. The complementary strand has to be anti-parallel and you combine A's with T's and C's with G's. So you can always figure out what the opposite strand of DNA is supposed to be. DNA replication begins at a specific site called the origin of replication. Eukaryotic chromosomes have multiple origins of replication. The first enzyme is going to be helicase, and this enzyme will break the hydrogen bonds between the bases on opposite strands. When it starts to break those hydrogen bonds, we produce what we call a replication fork. When the DNA is single-stranded, it needs to be stabilized with proteins called single-strand binding proteins. And because polymerase can't begin replication without having a nucleotide already there, we need to use a DNA primase enzyme to add an RNA primer. The RNA primer has a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end, just like the DNA. And then DNA polymerase can add new nucleotides and it always combines A's with T's and C's with G's. Polymerase can only add nucleotides in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction on the strand that it is making. Because each of the strands of DNA are anti-parallel, the strands are in opposite directions. So this top strand is going to be called the leading strand and the polymerase can continue replicating from that first primer and it can just keep following the movement of the helicase. Whereas the opposite strand is called the lagging strand and it has to be replicated in segments called Okazaki fragments. So the primase will add a primer and then the polymerase can add the nucleotides in the five prime to three prime direction, but it's moving in the opposite direction of the helicase. As the replication fork continues to progress, new primers need to be continually added to the lagging strand. And then the primers will be removed and replaced with DNA. And then an enzyme called ligase will come and seal the gaps, forming new phosphodiester bonds where the RNA primer was removed and replaced with DNA. The last thing that I want to just show you is that DNA replicates differently in prokaryotes or bacterial cells. Prokaryotic organisms have circular DNA, 
So they also have an origin of replication, but they only have one origin of replication, whereas our chromosomes have multiple origins. Because these chromosomes are circular, DNA polymerase can actually replicate in both directions at the same time because the opposite strand is going in the opposite direction. So there's still a five prime end and a three prime end. And the new DNA strand, this blue strand here, will be replicating in the same direction. The new strand always is made in the five to three direction. And then going this way on the opposite strand, that will also be in the five prime to three prime direction. And then we end up with two new DNA molecules where the original purple strand was the template and the new blue strand is the new strand. And both of these copies of DNA are identical. So we looked at a lot of different enzymes and proteins that are involved in the process of replication. One other one that I want to just mention quickly is called topoisomerase. This is an enzyme that will relieve supercoils. Think about having two pieces of string. And if you wind them together, because DNA is a helical structure, if you start to pull those strings of DNA apart, what's gonna happen? It's going to get tighter and tighter behind the replication fork. So we use topoisomerase enzymes to relieve those supercoils. So basically it cuts it so that the tension can be relieved and then it seals back together. So here is a summary chart of all of the proteins that are involved in DNA replication.